Welcome back, everyone. We're here to talk to Menphilia to report back to what we learned about Rael and everything about that. So go ahead and head on and do that now. Welcome back, my friend. I have already received word from Alfino. To think that Flame Marshal Huayu was the Galian agent. I know not what to say. Together with Robon, Aline lent us much needed aid at the time of our order's founding. She was particularly passionate about the need to tackle the primal threat. When we discussed the subject, her eyes fairly shone with determination. Whatever else she may have been, I choose to believe that it was her true self with whom I spoke then. But now is not the time to dwell on such matters. I have an important announcement to make regarding our effort to defeat the Asians. We shall begin as soon as everyone is assembled. My thanks for coming, friends. Moonbreeder, the floor is yours. By now, I'm sure you're all familiar with White Aurasite, the miraculous material that will allow us to capture Asian souls. Back at Snowcloak, we verified its ability to absorb vast amounts of ether. Alas, it leaves something to be desired in the area of stability. The stone can only store ether for a short while before expelling its contents. In addition to Aurasite's inherent limitations, we must needs be wary of our enemy's strength. Our foe draweth upon an infinite wellspring of power. Even should we succeed in entrapping him, the stone will not long contain his wrath. Meaning that, if we want to kill the swine, we'll have to be quick about it. Tis our belief that an Asian soul may be permanently undone, if smitten by a sufficiently concentrated burst of pure ether. The only trouble is, we can't say for sure how concentrated the burst needs to be. Without knowing how much ether an Asian soul is composed of, we're basically guessing. Our sole clue lieth in thy struggle with La Habrea. During that encounter, Heidelin bid you forge what she called a Blade of Light, a weapon which took the form of a luminous stream of energy. Based on your description, we believe the blade with which you vanquished your foe was composed of ether. Admittedly, your victory proved ephemeral, as La Habrea was able to use a crystal of darkness to flee into the space that lies between our world and the void. The fact remains, however, that Heidelin placed the means to destroy the Asians in your hands. Be that as it may, it would be unwise to assume that you will do the same when we next encounter such a foe. Quite so, my lady. We must needs find the means to forge our own blade of ether. One to equal that which Heidelin did benevolently bestow upon her champion. That is all well and good, but it seems to me that producing such a blade will require a prodigious quantity of ether. Whence will it come, pray tell? Um, oh, what if we had two pieces of white orosite? One to trap the Asian, and the other to store the ether for the blade. Oh, nice try. But it's as I said, the stone won't hold ether for any length of time. We'd still need to collect the stuff there and then, sorry to say. And therein lies the rub. Finding a way to create the blade whenever and wherever we choose. It would seem more research is in order. I'm going to linger a while perform a few more tests on the aura site. And I could do with some help. Orianger, why don't you lend me a hand? M mine apologies, but I am required at the Waking Sands. Lady Minfilia hath given me sole charge of the premises. T'would be unseemly to leave them unattended. Sole charge, you say? So you're basically alone there, then? Well, that settles it. I'll just have to come to you. While you were afield, word arrived from the Charlian motherland. 
You will recall that a survey party was dispatched to investigate the incident at the Isle of Val. What they discovered was troubling, to say the least. According to the report, the Isle has been erased from existence. It was as if a hole had been torn in the very fabric of reality. Aye. Yet the mystery endeth not with the Isle's disappearance. It hath come to light that a number of scholars in various other locales were reported missing at a similar juncture. What's more, they all had something in common with the head of the students of Baldessian. Every last one of them was researching a phenomenon called dimensional compression, or the rejoining as the ancient texts call it. I'll be damned if that's a coincidence. All indications suggest Asian involvement. But I sense that a force greater still is at work. The entity the Dark Beings call the One True God. We must pray that my dear friend Kryl regains consciousness soon. If she bore witness to the Isle of Val's final moments, she may be able to shed some light on this mystery. And there we go. Following the Calamity, the forces of the 14th Imperial Legion entrenched themselves in strategic locations across Eorzea. So swiftly did they accomplish this, it was suspected that they had received help. To think that it came from Huayu, my right hand. There is more. We have reason to believe that Huayu didn't deal exclusively with the 14th. She also answered to a higher authority in Golomor. But this higher authority could not have been the Emperor. By consenting to the media project, Solus Zos Galvis showed himself to be more concerned about preventing the spread of primal influence than claiming Eorzea for the Empire. He would happily have seen the lot reduced to ash. We believe a number of high-ranking figures within the royal household were against the decision, but that they knew better than to oppose the Emperor openly. Of course, this didn't prevent them from making clandestine provisions, in which Huayu played a part. Alas, these provisions did not prevent Dalamud from falling, and the ensuing chaos changed the face of the realm forever. Yet Eorzea survived. To all intents and purposes, the Meteor Project had failed, and the Empire was left to rule its lack of a decisive means to eliminate the Primals. Until, that is, it stumbled upon the Ultima Weapon. Even before the accursed thing was dug up, it seemed to me the 14th had the might to overwhelm our weakened armies. Yet they chose to hide behind their walls. Why? The Black Wolf was wary of making the denizens of Eorzea desperate, lest more primals emerge to bleed the land. The discovery of the Ultima Weapon, however, emboldened him to resume his war of conquest in earnest. But there was one in Garlemald who believed that Van Belsar's actions were premature. One who stood higher in the Imperial Army's chain of command. He ordered the Legatus to halt his advance, only to find that the Black Wolf had slipped its leash, and that the 14th now acted alone. In a bid to bring Van Belsar to heel, he used the agent he had planted in Ulda prior to the Calamity to undermine the Legion's efforts. A man who outranks Van Belsa, who opposed the late Emperor's decision to annihilate Eorzea. This could only be the former High Legatus of the Galian army, now known as Emperor Vorisos Galvis. So he was Huayu's true master. But one of several in actual fact, we've learned that even as Huayu served the Empire's interests, she sold Imperial secrets to a certain faction in Eorzea. In so doing, she helped to maintain the status quo, thus prolonging the conflict. Considering who stands to profit from war, it isn't hard to imagine who her other masters were. 
Seven Hells? You mean to say that she was a double agent? Huh, triple. If you consider her services to Ben Belsar and the new Emperor as separate. As neatly as these pieces seem to fit, one aspect of the puzzle remains unclear to me. By whose will was the Marshal feeding intelligence to the heretics? And try as I might, I fail to see how aiding their cause would profit either her Imperial or Monitorist Masters. Could it be that another hand is at work here? If so, why you must be made to reveal whose it is. <sighs> Not only have I lost a trusted friend, now I must interrogate her as a stranger. Not a pleasant task, I grant you, but a necessary one. Unless we weed out the ivy, root, stalk and stem, it will simply grow back. I know that full well. Those closest to Huayu have already been detained, and I will question them alongside her. General, pray keep in mind that there may be unwitting abettors among them. All will be treated fairly. On that you have my word. Those who are innocent have no cause to fear. You have ever been a friend of truth, General. I hope the unpleasant task of weeding out falsehood will not detain you too long. Though it be for the sake of Eorzea, doubting one's comrades is poison to the soul. And with that, I take my leave. years. I've been made to dance to their tune. How could you, Huayu? How could you side with them? Those cankers who take from this land and give naught in return, who use their power to disempower and grow fat while the people starve. I know you can hear me, monitor as scum. Your crimes will not go unpunished! They have purged this land of your sickness! Before the eyes of the Twelve, I swear it! I shall have no further need of you this day. Your Grace. I fear that not even my own chambers shall remain private for long. Has the situation grown so grim? Ever since he proposed the Cardinal Reclamation Bill, Taleji Adeleji has risen to greater prominence upon the backs of impoverished refugees. The Monetarists were ever united in their pursuit of profit, but the man's actions have torn a rift in their ranks. They snap at each other as rabid dogs. Yet now is not the time to be bickering among ourselves. If this bickering is a threat to law and order, might you not have grounds to dissolve the Syndicate? Would that the solution were so simple, Admiral. Alas, my moving to dissolve the Syndicate is certain to spark outrage among the influential merchant class, whom the Cabal represents. This would serve to exacerbate the current unrest, and peace would slip still further away. Be they rich or poor, natives or refugees, all who reside in Uldar have a right to pursue happiness. It is the duty of a ruler to protect this right. If I am to perform my duty, I must needs tread warily. It would not do to make enemies heedlessly. Were Lord Lolorito here, he would doubtless say that I have my head in the clouds. A ruler is required to take a wide view. 
Try as we might to cater to all needs, some will inevitably be overlooked. As such, there shall ever be citizens who feel aggrieved. It cannot be helped. But as you have informed us, the monetarists take no view but their own. They hunger for power while the masses starve. In the absence of a common cause, it seems beyond any one individual to make Uldar whole. And the presence of a Galian agent within the immortal flames only makes matters worse. Even accounting for Uldar's historic reliance upon mercenaries, such a grievous breach of security is unprecedented. I fear this business will provide the monetarists with a rod to beat Rauban. Eorzea can ill afford for the immortal flames to be dampened now. Ere long, the Garleans will turn their ravenous gaze toward our lands once more. If we are to resist their might, our nations must stand together. Yet for this to happen, our nations must be whole. Cannot be done to improve the situation in Ulda. The true wealth of Ulda lies in the health, happiness, and hopes of her citizens. Alas, the citizens shall never know these things, so long as their lives are ruled by the ambitions of the few. The monetarists claim to represent the best interests of the people, but in sooth they desire only to manipulate them for their own selfish ends. For the government to serve the people, it must be formed of the people. For Ulda to move forward, it is not only the Syndicate that must be dissolved. Nay, you jest. My friends, it was for no other reason than to make known to you mine intent that I requested your presence here. When I make my declaration to the people, chaos shall inevitably ensue. As the last monarch in the line of Ul, I make unto you this request. Help Roban to preserve order, and protect the people. Forsake them, and you forsake yourselves. For a strong Eorzea will ever have need of a strong Ulda. Your Grace, are you certain of this? There is no other way. When the time is ripe, the nation shall become a true republic. Both royalists and monetarists shall cease to be. Uldar will no longer belong to kings or queens or merchant princes, but to her people. Roban, forgive me for casting aside all that you have toiled for in my name. Beyond this gesture, I am powerless to help my subjects. Alright, well that takes care of 2.4, so we're getting into 2.5 now. I'm most eager to address the Cyan threat, however we dare not neglect our other pressing concerns. Both know full well that Saint Shiva was not the last primal we face, and our relationship with Ishgar is still tenuous at best. I think the resolution of the primal threat was once the sole priority of the science of the seventh dawn. Some days I wonder if it was wise for us to take on so many other responsibilities. Lest you forget it, Incineant, the science sh need not shoulder the burn alone. Were not the crystal braves established for this very reason? True, we are present with a multitude of problems, however we have all the resources we need to address them in turn. Narn, in particular, is ever a steadying hand, who I trust will continue to support the Braves. To what we do, do we owe the pleasure? Have you been? Has there been further developments regarding the situation you dull? 
As expected, the Moral Flames have been struggling to cope with the revelation that one of their highest ranking officers was a Garlinian agent. Suffice to say, Teliji Aladiji and his Motarius Ilk have wasted no time in attempting to turn the situation to their advantage. Coupled with ongoing unrest, the Flames are finding themselves hard pressed. Plainly, General Bond needs our help, and I will reject the Crystal Braves to offer what support they can. If I am to stay abreast of the latest developments and issue effective orders, however, I cannot afford to waste time traveling back and forth. And so, for the foreseeable future, I would think it would be best if I were to re remain in Udal, unless you have an objection. None whatsoever. We have matters here, here well in hand. What? Unbrida's research is proceeding as planned. So she tells me, though I'm not familiar with the details. Orin J is poring over his tomes at the Waking Sands, and the others are contributing in their own ways. Last, the key problem, how to form an ethereal braid at will, remains unsolved. Nevertheless, it is only a matter of time. Narn, while we focus on the task, may help you assist Alphanod in his braves with theirs. I would do much to restore faith in the Immortal Flames if the Warrior of Light was seen working on their behalf. Now forget that your esteemed status allows you to act in ways that those more tightly bound to organizations and nations cannot. As ever, I employ you to do so. Not that your response was ever in doubt, but I humbly thank you once more for aiding our cause. Now then, there were preparations I must attend to before my departure, such as receiving Royal's latest report. He has proven to be quite skilled at gathering information others wish to keep secret, hence why I placed him under my direct command, and ordered him to investigate the Udon riots. When you're finished here, join me outside. Depending on what he has to say, I may soon have a favor to ask. If there are any developments on our front, I shall inform you at once in the usual fashion. Now we do have a uh, a letter, which I think is probably my Shadowbringer stuff. So we'll have to grab that before we leave. Pleasure as always, Naren. You'll be escorting the commander to Udal, I take it. Actually, I have another task in mind for her. You should be so kind as to repeat your report for her benefit. Right then. Me and Amai have been taking inquiries into the source of the weapons which found their ways into refugee hands a, while ba a ways back. This happens we caught wind of something promising. A rather large purchase of those sharp and pointy things back by a black marketeer to hold up near Highbridge. Doubt that this man would have secured such a quantity of weapons. If he did not already have clients waiting, clients that for whatever reason would prefer this transaction to remain secret. Brings to mind that that merchant we caught an arrow while talking to Narin, didn't it? Generous fellow he was, doling out swords and spears to the downtrodden and disgruntled. Which isn't to say that these clients have the same mischief in mind, but if you want to be sure, it must be prudent to intervene before they collect their goods, savvy? Seizing the weapons before they fall into the wrong hands would be for the best. However, if we strike at the appointed hour, we might capture the Black Marketeer as well as his clients. What say you, Narin? That's settled. Rumbi view with Captain Ilbird at Highbridge and intervene when this exchange takes place. Now then, if you would excuse me, I must leave for you, Dahl. I expect good tidings. Alright, uh, high bridge is... I don't remember. <laughs> Thonalon, apparently. Eastern Thonalon. Okay. Well, first I want to find a mailbox, so let's go ahead and do that.
Pretty sure there's one not too far away. Ah, uh, yep, right here, actually. Alright, we got our stuff here. Let's go ahead and take it. Nice, nice. So we're gonna wind up Fran. A granny horn. And I believe in our armory should be the... Evolver, the gunbreaker uh, weapon. So that's pretty neat. Let's go ahead and grab our new minion here. Very neat, okay. Now let's go to Eastern Thonalon while we can. back. Uh, had a little bit of a loading issue with the thing there. Like, stuttered my recording. Thankfully it was like right in the middle of a loading screen, so it didn't really matter. But uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our new mount. We don't get many of those, so uh, be interested in seeing how this one looks. Ooh. It's kind of like an actual, like, steed type of mount. Like our chocobo in a way. This is an interesting uh, music track, I guess. Huh. It looks like we've made it. And Nara, my scouts have been keeping a close eye on the Black Marketeer. It seems that his guests have arrived. It also seems that he's hired more than a few men to stand guard. Common thugs have no consequence, but they nevertheless pose a threat. Even so, I feel compelled to apologize. This is far beneath a woman of your standing. Captain Lovedier does need to have it dispatched you either. But powerful men only have ever have need of loyal, able-bodied friends. Having found one in you, it is only natural that he would come to rely upon you without hesitation. Okay. Now then, we should make the make for the burning wall without delay and secure those weapons. First unit will ensure that the clients can escape with me and Aaron. So we're going pretty far here, actually. So it's this area we're heading to. I spy the one man, but there's sure to be others. I have a plan. While you approach the sentry and create a distraction, my men and I will slip past and catch the black marketeer unawares. Once you've disposed of the thugs, wait first outside the tunnel entrance. Any questions? Then let us be off. Good luck, my friend. Okay. Ah, there they are. Who goes there? An adventure? Damn fool, you should never come here. 
Yeah, hello there. Damn. Oh, there's another one, actually. Ah, another one. I guess we're heading this way then. Those guys did not put up much of a challenge, that's for sure. Mirror Knights, okay. Don't understand what this is all about. And they're screaming, that's probably not a good sign. Oh, that's uh, not good there, Albert. As you can see, this is a fine mess. When I tried to restrain him, he drew a hidden blade, I lashed out. Before I could disarm him, one of my subordinates had panicked, and this is the result. How foolish of me to underestimate the bastard, and to bring an inexperienced recruit. Caval Commander Livernier will be most disappointed. Damn it all, a golden opportunity wasted. As for the clients, though we do not know how, they slip past our perimeter. At present, the first is currently tracking a party of desk white cell swords we suspect may be them. Would that be a, well, we could have enlisted the aid of the immortal flames of blast braids. Alas, we're here to aid them. They're in no position to aid us. But at the very least, we have secured the weapons, yet even that accomplishment is lacking, for the information received indicated a massive shipment. This is anything but. Well, this was a fine mess. I'll join the first in their hunt for desk white cell swords. If the gods are good, we'll catch them before they escape to the Black Shroud. In the meantime, I ask you to deliver these weapons to Udal, my steed. Trust them to the third Yu Yuhaze. They'll take care of the rest. Alright, we're heading to Udal then. Okay, where are we heading?
Through this way, huh? Okay. Getting close to that maintenance window there. So I need to hurry up. <laughs> Ah, the Warrior of Light, ever-reliable friend to the Crystal Braves. You have my deepest thanks for your assistance to Corinthians. Now what brings you to us this day? A gift of weapons from a certain black marketeer, courtesy of Captain Ilbert, you say? Understood. Once we've cataloged the contents, I'll have them delivered to the Hall of Flames. This cannot be everything, can it? We're all a state of confidence that there would be a great, far greater quantity of weapons. A blatant falsehood. Clearly, Ryle is unfamiliar with the ways of you Don merchants, who ever strive to present themselves as greater than they are. We should be thankful that this information was not completely erroneous, and that we managed to achieve anything worth of all. This is something still worth celebrating, isn't it, Lieutenant? Besides, we've got more important things to worry about, like fighting those Garlinians up north. There'll be no fighting if I have anything to say about it. Our orders to stand watch, not to seek glory in battle. If you have no further need of us, then I shall take my unit to Cerulean Processing Plant. Time for the fourth to earn their keep, eh? Fight well, L9, for the freedom of all. Excellent work as always, my friend. Rest assured that the Immortal Flames will hear of your contribution. Until we meet again. Narn, a word if you please ye. Not here. Look for me at the Sapphire Avenue Exchange. No need for whistling this time. Don't ye worry. Alright, well that seems kind of suspicious, but uh, let's see what this guy has to say. Thanks for indulging me, Quest. Few places better than a market for privacy, I find. All the hustle and the bustle, or commerce, means most conversations go unnoticed. I'll get to the point. At the burning wall, when you and the captain interrupted their exchange, what happened? Tell me everything and leave no detail out. Hmm, that's not quite how the first told it. These dusk whites they were chasing, latest words that we lost the trail. But you never saw him yourself, not before the fighting started, and not after. <laughs> Something ain't right. I don't know what it is, but I can feel it in my bones. I'm not daft enough to be misled by some merchant's drunken boast. Our information is reliable, goddammit. I know he purchased those weapons. Hmm, as if I've never deciphered a moneylender's books, or I had to follow a transaction back to its source. Did plenty of that back when the Braves were start getting started, believe me. Commander wanted assurances that we were, weren't taking Gil from the wrong sort of benefactors. Of course, these days the money flows like water, and the first and third get the shiniest new toll is. Forgive me, friend. I have a lot on my minds these days, and I appreciate you lending an ear. Right then, best get back to it. Hmm. Something's going on, apparently. Naran, can you hear me? This is Chitaru. 
presence is urgently requested at the Rising Stones. Please come and see me as soon as you're able. Nice. Alright, I wonder what's going on this time. Thank you for coming so quickly, Narn. We have a guest from Ishgard who wishes to speak with you, a most um, determined lady by all indications. Uh-oh, looks like we have a... Something come up here. Our guest is with the Incendiant in the solar at the present. Let's not keep them waiting any longer, shall we? Okay. We have a guest from Ishgard who wishes to speak with you. I believe the two of you have met. We have. I had hoped to speak with Commander Leveilleur as well, but I cannot afford to wait any longer. The Lord Commander sent me hither to request your aid in a matter of grave import. You see now why I had Tataru summon you. Now that we're all assembled, Perhaps you would be good enough to elaborate on the nature of the matter which brought you to us. The Observatorium's astrologians have sounded the alarm. Last night, the Dragon Star burned with an intensity not seen in 15 summers. Not since the Dravanians engaged the Empire in the Battle of Silvertear Skies. Hmm. The northern sky doth burn full bright upon the Worm Lord's call. The red behemoth beckoneth, and flame consumeth all. The old Curthen rhyme, aye. The brightening of the dragon sty is said to accompany the roar of a great worm. The astrologians believe that it was Midgard Soma himself who cried out on this occasion. After an absence of centuries, the King of Kings did return to lead his kind against the might of Garlemald. Only to fall in his duel with the Agrius, proud flagship of the Galian fleet. Devoid of life, his corpse remaineth entwined about the Magitek monstrosity even unto this day. Ariange has the right of it. Whatever this alteration in the Dragon Star portends, the Great Worm has shown no sign of life. Tataru, have the Domans reported aught out of the ordinary? Correct me if I'm wrong, but if Midgard Zorma had roared, wouldn't we have heard it here in Revenant's Toll? Roar is but a figure of speech. Dravanians can communicate in ways beyond our kin. It is for this very reason that we are forced to look for signs in the heavens. We cannot say with any confidence that a great worm roared at all, much less that it was Midgard Sorma. Only by directly examining the Keeper of the Lake can we be certain. However, it will take too long to gain the Holy See's approval to dispatch the Temple Knights. Therefore, Sir Emric would entrust this task to you. Do you accept? We knew you would not disappoint us. Now if you would excuse me, I must return and assist the Lord Commander. We have precious little time to prepare. 
to prepare for what, pray tell? When a great worm rolls, his brethren cannot choose but answer. We prepare for battle. Forgive me if I say odd, but which you already know, but I ensure that you understand the nature of your destination. As Yoren J stated, we are now we are now called the Keeper of the Lake is the Repage of the Argirius, former flagship of the Imperial Fleet, and the corpse of the Rhyme Rhyme responsible for its destruction. Fifteen years ago, as the next step in his campaign to sub sub subjugate Erzale, Gaius von Belsar attempted to seize control of Mordana. So massive was his force that all thought his victory a foregone conclusion. But an unlikely ally came to Orizel's aid that day. Midgar Zomer, legendary guardian of Silver Tier Falls, burst forth from beneath the waters of the lake and led a host of dragons against the Garlani airships overhead. What would later become known as the Battle of Silver Tier Skies, the Great Worm fell countless airships before engaging the Argus. In the ensuing struggle, the flagship's Cerulean engines failed and it tumbled into the lake below. Yet this victory came at a great cost, for the explosion which followed could in the life of the Great Worm as well. That same explosion transformed Silvertier Falls into the desolate wasteland it is today, draining the lake of its waters and crystallizing ether for bombs around. Yet a remnant of the lake remains, and at its center a constant reminder of that fateful day long ago. In accordance to Sir Emmerich's wishes, our domain allies have been standing watch over the Keeper of the Lake. It would be wise to speak with them before investigating the wreckage yourself. Be careful, my friend. We know not the dangers await you within. Now then, let us not neglect our own task. There is much to be done, and precious little time to do it. Sorry, I can speed this along because I have about uh, 17 minutes left before I get cut off in maintenance. It's this way we're heading. Okay. Here, look, miss, I was about to send word to Revenant's Toll about the Garlinians. Of late, I've seen small airships, likely from Castrum Centri, come and go from the Keeper of the Lake. Though I cannot say for certain at this distance, I believe they may be salvaging something from within the wreckage. Castrum's supply lines have been cut for some time, and I wager they're desperately in need of spare parts and other equipment. So it's true then, the Ishgardians honestly fear the worm might rise again. Well, from here, that seems rather unlikely, but if it's the insurances they want, you have no choice but to inspect the corpse in its entirety. Easier said than done, given the creatures which inhabit the wreckage, and the aforementioned Garlinians won't, who won't take kindly to your presence. They're sure to fire upon an airship, so I advise a more stealthy approach. Take this boat and a few of your comrades to the base of the Argirius, then climb to the top. It's the only viable approach, I'd say. Oh, okay, we're already at the dungeon.
I didn't realize that giant dragon thing there was the actual, uh, thing, huh? Like, I remember seeing that tower before. I didn't realize that would be the actual, like, place. I was thinking it'd probably be, like, in a cave or something somewhere, but this huge thing? Wow. Okay. Well, in any case, uh, next time we will be continuing on with the uh, Keep of the Lake dungeon. So, see you guys then.